Why, hello there. Of course, nobody's here, but hello there, whoever you are, whenever you are coming to uh, see us. It is March 7th, and um, I am Jenna McDonald. I'm on the board of directors for the Rye Historical Society, and we are currently reading just Rye Harbor for our history happy hour. Um, they're just about wrapping up the dredging of Rye Harbor right now, and we thought it'd be fun to learn more about the harbor as they were doing that. So I am picking up where Janet had left off, chapter 25, Flotsam and Jetsam. But it is happy hour. So I've got my rum and coke here, and I encourage you to get your own cocktail or mocktail. We do wholly support mocktails. Um, and I will, cheers, start reading. All right, Flotsam and Jetsam. Some old timers like to allude to the fact that Rye Harbor has a latitude of 43, zero degrees north, that is 43 degrees, oh, this is how you say it, 43 degrees, zero minutes, and zero seconds north. That should make the number 43 a very lucky one for local fishermen and boaters. To complete its coordinates, the long, long, longitude, 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 uh, my vocabulator's not working, is 070, wait, so that'd be 70 degrees, 44 minutes, and zero seconds west. The only thing that spoils the perfect 4300 is that the United States Geological Survey, National Mapping Information Online Service, gives Rye Harbor's latitude a bit too exactly as 43 degrees, zero minutes, five seconds north. With a longitude of 70 degrees, 44 minutes, 56 degrees, uh, uh, Nope, that's the last one, uh, seconds west. We choose to go by the traditional 43000 figure, which adds to the mysterious, haunting, unique air of Rye Harbor. The Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names Online gives Milwaukee County the exact same latitude. 43000 north, other spots with nearly the same latitude are Milwaukee, the city, Wisconsin, just 43 degrees, two minutes north. Um, Sapporo, Japan, 43 degrees, four minutes north. Vladivostok, Russia, 43 degrees, seven minutes north. Alma-Ata, Russia, 43 degrees, 14 minutes north. Marseille, France, 43 degrees, 18 minutes minutes north, and Sofia, Bulgaria at 42 degrees, 42 minutes north. At high tide, the harbor measures 46.83 acres with only 30.45 acres at low tide. The perimeter is 6,598.24 feet, and the width of the harbor opening to the ocean is 344.29 feet. Boy, that was a lot of numbers to read. I'm gonna have a drink. Few harbors along the New England coast are situated so that skippers, especially with sailboats, can be in the open ocean within a few minutes of dropping a mooring. Rise popularity and limited area is such that the wait for a mooring can last a decade or more. The harbor has only 127 moorings, 57 of which are for commercial vessels. There are four private wharfs in the harbor, but only two, one at Saunders and the other owned by Stephen Foss, are currently being used. Pleasure boat moorings are not transferable when a boat is sold, but commercial moorings can be transferred to a new owner, but only if continued for commercial purposes. There is nothing more controversial in the harbor than the subject of moorings, so the procedure is now closely regulated by the state and monitored by the harbor master. I have a kitty up on the bar who's looking to be naughty. Don't be naughty. 
don't be naughty. Okay. During summer weekends, the marina parking lot is filled with boat trailers as dozens of smaller vessels are launched from the ramp. For day-long activities. For example, on July 3rd, 2004, 61 boats were launched and 111 cars were parked, each vehicle carrying passengers for the several tour and charter boats. During the spring and fall, the launch ramp is also busy with larger vessels, especially sailboats, being put in for the season or hauled out before winter. Why, hello, Frankie. This is my kitty, Frankie. Apparently, she's a history buff, or she wants to know where the treat that I took away from her went. Yes, yes, mommy's reading. <laughs> Leo Axton remarks that the often mentioned landmark, the Mile Buoy, is in some ways a misnomer. It is seven eighths of a mile from the Rye Harbor entrance and one and a quarter miles from the end of the harbor dock. There is an exact one mile mark from the buoy, and it is Axton's Granite State mooring. Axton assures us this is complete coincidence. The buoy is a lighted whistle buoy, but some people love calling it a groaner to explain the sound more accurately. It is clearly marked with a RH on it for Rye Harbor. In case someone forgets where they are, this buoy replaced the former buoy outside the harbor in the 1960s. The old one was not lighted and was painted black. The November 1st, 1968 Portsmouth Herald ran a photograph of antennas set up at Rye Harbor State Park. Area residents had been wondering about their purpose. According to State Director of Parks, Russell B. Toby, this was one of four sites in New England used for radio positioning by a ship mapping the continental shelf. The firm in charge of the work was the Lorac Service Corporation of Houston. The survey was scheduled to take several months. Beside the smallest antenna in the picture, there was a 130 foot antenna connected to a portable transmitter housed in a horse trailer. So what picture are they talking about? There is a picture here that just talks about the uh, busy day at the Rye Harbor Marina. <clears throat> so if you haven't noticed that uh, these are just little stories, little snippets, so there's no um, kind of running plot going. This is each little story. All right, so here is another one. Ray Maimone, or Maimone reminded us to look for the following newspaper story. The Portsmouth Herald of July 1st, 1975 ran a photo and caption portraying the strange totem erected by Herbert Drake in the summer of 1974. The peak of the totem is shaped as the tail of a mako shark, mako shark, a powerful mackerel shark found in the Atlantic according to the caption. Under that comes the head of a sturgeon, a fish valued for its flesh and a source of caviar. At the pole's bottom appears a sun-bleached lobster that is representative of the creatures of the sea from which so many area folk earn their living. Hmm. Time for a sip. Jack Woodworth, a former dock master, now deceased, is remembered at Rye Harbor. His name tag and red cane chair are still there. Another story, at a Rye town meeting in 1796, it was voted that nobody shall haul up any seaweed from daylight down to daylight in the morning, and that nobody shall heap up any seaweed below high water mark, neither by day or night. It was voted at the same time that there shall be $10 forfer for the breach of the above vote. The one half of the fine for the complainer, the other half for the use of the poor of said town. Joe Bentley was recalling for a tourist the summer of 2002 and its drought. The visitor from the Midwest saw low tide and sympathized with Joe about the dry conditions she could see with her own eyes to the side of the harbor. Joe said, wait six hours. After the whale watch, the woman looked out on Rye Harbor's high tide and commented, did I miss a huge rainstorm? Boy, that's kind of sad that you are so far, so far away from the sea that you don't know the tides change. <laughs> All right. 
Judy Dubois of Rye Harbor, when once asked, what lake is this? Calmly replied without missing a beat, Lake Atlantic. Always a historian at heart, Judy in the summer of 2004 donated her family's huge, authentic early 20th century wardrobe to the Hampton Historical Society to share with the children of our future. All right, next we uh, come up to a familiar site for most people because Ray's has been there forever and it still is. So there's Ray's. Essayist Sandra Goss Muncy remembers, sometime after World War II was over, Ray Parker decided to open a lobster pound on Foss Beach, just north of Rye Harbor. He purchased a house and built a small building toward the rear of the lot to house the business, leaving a good-sized area in front for parking. He constructed two wooden tanks, one above the other in the rear portion. A long bench on the right side held several gas cooking units suitable for boiling lobsters in enameled cooking pots. The left side provided space for an old ice cream freezer that served as an ice chest to display lobster meat and as a bench for supplies and an old hand operated cash register. A cast off kitchen sink between the lobster tanks and the cooking units completed the setup. While in college, I worked for Ray over two summers plus, shucking out lobster meat selling lobsters and clams to retail customers, buying from the local fishermen, and even helping to keep his books. Ray was committed to purchasing his supply from the local men before seeking supplies elsewhere. As a result, except during the shedding season, all of the lobsters he sold were from the waters off rye. Lobsters must shed their shells in order to grow. I was fortunate to watch a lobster shed one day at Ray's. It reminded me of someone taking a sweater off over the head. The back split and the lobster slipped out. Because the living meat is soft, it manages to slip the larger claws down through the knuckle joints, incredible as it seems. Then the lobster flipped its tail out of the tail shell. It takes an extended time to accomplish the shedding, during which the lobster is totally vulnerable to predators and other lobsters. Muncie continues with her memories. Ray piped salt water in from the tidewater marsh behind the pound, which tended to be fairly warm on a hot July day. To keep the water cool enough to prevent the lobsters from dying, Ray had to pump and had a pump and pipes for circulation. His last duty before going to bed each night was checking the pump. During extremely hot weather, he would even rise during the night and check again. Well, one very hot night, the worst happened. Ray checked the pump, but at some time during the night, probably shortly after he had checked, it failed. On arriving at work the next morning, Peter Batchelder and I greeted, were greeted by a closed sign in the driveway and Ray busily cooking lobsters. It was a hot and very smelly day. To recover at least something out of the financial de disaster that the pump failure represented, we cooked every lobster that didn't move or looked sleepy. In fact, most all of his lobsters. Lobsters begin to rot very quickly after dying if uncooked. Muncie goes on. In fact, in nature or in a lobster pound, as soon as a lobster becomes sleepy, the other lobsters generally will start to cannibalize it. When lobster goes bad, it smells bad. As soon as Peter and I twisted the tail from a body, the smell of soft looking tail meat would assail up. After Every three or four cookers full, about 20 pounds of lobster each, Peter and I would take a short walk outside for a breath of fresh air. We saved quite a bit of meat that day, but we lost much more. After that episode, Ray vowed he would bring a pipe across Ocean Boulevard in order to pump seawater directly from the ocean. Muncie then recalls the second summer she worked for Ray. He had built a larger pound on the edge of the marsh behind the original building. It had a large concrete steam cooker that would hold 60 or 70 pounds of lobster at once and even allow Ray to cook giant 25 to 35 pound lobsters caught by draggers in deep water. A shucking sink with a shelf on the front edge had running seawater. A large floor level concrete tank provided long term storage of lobsters, allowing storage of lobsters in the spring in preparation for the shedding season in July when demand is high. A floor built above this tank held a row of wooden tanks with a space for a future second row. Multiple pumps provided protection against another failure. That year, Jimmy Jameson worked 
worked with me. Ray even provided a radio in the new pound so we could have entertainment while we worked. At that time, the lobster men still used wooden pegs to close lobster claws, but cutting corners whenever they could, most lobster men only pegged the crusher claw. That left the pincher claw functional. When handling one lobster, it was always a bit of a trick to avoid getting nipped by a nearby lobster. One day, when filling a bag with a woman's purchase, one of the lobsters, already in the bag, reached up and grabbed hold of my arm with a pincher claw. Now, the purpose of a pincher claw is to hold and cut. Hold and cut my arm, it did. When I stepped back from the bag, the lobster came with me. There I was, lobster hanging from my arm, blood dripping on the floor from the cut, my efforts failing to detach the lobster. The customer asked, doesn't that hurt? My response was, not as much as it will to have to break off the lobster's claw and turn it into a cull. The price was low, lower for a one-armed lobster or cull. The lobster didn't let go. It became a cull. At least she didn't ask if I hurt the lobster. <laughs> Muncie adds, from the beginning of his business, Ray's mother and aunt made lobster rolls and sold them from the front porch of the house. Eventually, the house opened as a restaurant. Later, the Widens ran the business, having been involved in lobster fishing for years themselves. That was a nice long story. And I've got two viewers now. Hello. Cheers. Rye Harbor always attracted the excitement of children. The 1935 report of the advisory committee of the Rye Harbor Project mentions that in the summer of 1934, the Portsmouth chapter of the National Red Cross together with the Rye Branch, conducted a series of swimming lessons for 100 or more pupils. These courses were under the supervision of a professional instructor who found this pool to be one of the best and safest places for swimming lessons. William Verrill writes that in the late 1940s, swimming at that spot was continued by Red Cross swimming lessons, organized by Betty Green, a school board member, and later a longtime Rye State representative. The lessons were originally held on the mud flats at the White Bridge north of Rye Harbor. Later, they were given at the Red Bridge. Hmm. So there's a picture here captioned, many local and summer children had their swimming lessons at the White Bridge WV. And that is right there. In the late 1950s, Tony Remick of Rye built a small seafood restaurant on Route 1A adjacent to the creek just south of the harbor. In 1959, Carlisle and Virginia Randall, who had recently built a new home at 100 Harbor Road, purchased the restaurant. Carl, who had operated a small diner soon after graduating from high school, always liked to cook, but he had had a long career as a shoe factory superintendent. When the Rye Harbor Lobster Pound came on the market, Carl decided to take a break from the shoe business and together with their children, Peter and Susan, hello, hello, you go back. <laughs> uh, the Randalls operated the seasonal restaurant until 1965. During their ownership, they also built a small motel adjacent to the restaurant. The Randalls were friendly with Dick and Alma Locke, buying lobsters from Dick and for several years, homemade pies from Alma. And here's a picture of Carlisle Randall at a favorite activity, shucking clams. He lived at the harbor from 1958 until his death in 2001. There he is. Alma recalls Carl asking her to bake blueberry pie for a very favorite customer coming from California. She didn't want to admit that her secret recipe used boxed crust and Comstock canned fruit. So she tried the I'm too busy routine for several days, but Carl wouldn't take no for an answer. Finally, she agreed to do it. The day after the delicious treat was served, Carl reported to Alma what happened. The Westerner had raved that her native wild blueberry pie was the best he'd ever eaten. So began Alma's pie career at the Randalls. She made eight to 12 pies weekly for Carl using her secret recipe. She made about $20 a week, 
and with four children under 10 years of age who also loved her pies. It was a happy summer. And Alma's secret is safe with us. Carl and Virginia continued to live at the harbor until her death in 1991 and his in 2001. Throughout their years there, Carl often met returning fishermen at the commercial pier, sometimes trading a six pack of cool beverages for fresh cod or haddock. In memory of Carl's years at the harbor and because of his appreciation for the fishermen, his family placed a memorial bench in his honor next to the commercial pier. From the bench, one can look out through the harbor toward the White Island Lighthouse and the mile buoy where his ashes were scattered. After other ownerships, William Zekel purchased the restaurant property in 1978, demolished the small building, and constructed a much larger facility called the Pilot House. Why, hello! <laughs> um, Let's see, through the pilot house, where is that? <sighs> uh, which became known for exquisite dining. Seats on the upper tier offered views high above the marsh amidst flickering candlelight. It was a special treat upon entering the pilot house lobby to walk slowly by a fully equipped dory. Zekel sold the property at auction in 1990 to Alfred Arcity who changed the restaurant's name to Hemingway's and continued the fine dining concept. The outside boat-shaped deck in plain view as you approached the facility was an interesting area landmark. In 2001, North Shore Battery and Development purchased the property, raised the restaurant and motel, and constructed 12 condominium units to be offered as Rye Shores. All right. Harry Eames, a former Parks and Recreation employee at Rye Harbor, remembers a woman who arrived, looked about and exclaimed, oh, this is just like Cabot Cove. Maybe it was Angela Lansbury. One of the peak days for whale watchers in 2004 was June 12th, when 11 whales were sighted. As dock assistant Rosemary Clary met the Atlantic Queen 2, nicknamed Big Blue, coming in at 6 that evening. Passengers getting off were highly excited, some exclaiming, we saw 30 whales. When Rosemary mentioned this to Big Blue Captain Bradley Cook, he laughed and said, yes, it's true. Or was it the same whale 30 times? There's a picture here, John Wyden and the Andrew J. Scattering Fisherman Morris Mutt, Richardson's Ashes at Sea. All right, this cat, this cat is bothering me. Cat, you've got to get down. Okay. Many boat owners of Rye Harbor, such as John Wyden, John Savage, Sue Reynolds, and Leo Axton, have on occasion volunteered to drop the ashes of requesters' deceased loved ones off Rye Harbor. As the dust of the remains gently blows off into the sea on these trips, we can imagine hearing words such as the following by Woodsworth being gently spoken over the waters with solemn faces and strong voices by these hardy captains of Rye Harbor. Though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Let's see how we're doing here. This is a pretty long chapter. I may, uh, I think I'll do one more and then we will wrap it up, okay? So one more story. In 1975, Rick Gorin and his new partner, Jeff Ritter, drew up plans for a vessel that would get them out to the best fishing grounds faster, and as a result, give customers longer to fish. In May of that year, they went to Patterson, Louisiana, where they metal -hulled, their metal-hulled vessel was being built. The quarter-million-dollar craft was the newest and fastest party boat to run out of New Hampshire harbors. The vessel included a depth scanner and fish finder. Rick and Jeff then spent a week bringing the boat around Florida and up the coast to Rye Harbor. In the summer of 1976, the two partners began cashing in on their gamble, running charters on their new 75-foot sports fishing craft, the first Atlantic Queen. Rick was a member of the well-known Garin fishing family that has run boats out of Hampton for years. 
Jeff Ritter also came from a veteran fishing family, one that has operated for years out of Rye Harbor. Fisherwoman and artist Dee Dee O'Leary was supposed to be just the boat's galley girl, but she also helped guests haul their fish aboard. All right, so that is where we're going to leave it today. And I hope you will join us next week for the rest of the chapter on flotsam and jetsam, because there's just a lot of little stories here. Anyway, um, I hope everybody is handling being in this pandemic well. It looked like there were a lot of people out, beautiful day out. We were out driving around. Um, and I hope everyone's getting their vaccines and we're gonna return to normal soon. And we won't have to just sit here and read to you all. You'll be able to come by the museum. So anyway, on that note, have a wonderful week and um, keep checking us out. We're trying to keep it fun. Bye.